But I wanted to start by thanking the, thanking the organizers, so the European Forum for Northern Sweden and the North Sweden EU office for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today and also for having had the fantastic project visits supported by Cohesion Policy yesterday. It was very inspiring, seeing, inspiring to see how the RDF and Cohesion Policy have supported so many good projects in these regions. And importantly, to support solutions for your citizens by reducing commuting time to work or to university, supporting the skills for people to be ready for the future, and promoting business and, and tourism. And we are here today to speak about the importance of cohesion policy and how, what will happen after 2027. I think I'm speaking to a, a, an audience of converters. I mean, you all, speak, you all work in the regions, you all work in municipalities, research institutes, universities, in a way or the other, dealing with regional development. And you know, I don't, I'm not telling you anything new, that cohesion policy has been of great value for the European project and how it has shaped its future and how it will continue shaping its future, it's also very important. So we must have this open dialogue with all of those involved in the policy, but also those who are not involved in the policy, to ensure that cohesion post-2027 will be as good, but even more efficient, and deliver better results for the regions throughout Europe. Since its creation, the European Union rests on the ideal of solidarity, equal opportunities and cohesion. Basically, the person who was behind cohesion policy, as you probably all you know, Jacques Delors, who was a visionary and unfortunately died recently, he knew that if he wanted to continue deepen and widening the internal market, bringing all the economic and social development to all the regions in the, and the, all the member states in the European Union, we had to take care of the most vulnerable regions. Not only because they need more tools and support to benefit from this internal market, but also because they were the ones who risked being more affected by the internal market. Because if you bring free move, freedom of movement, of goods, services, people and capital, where will they move to? Normally to the richest regions. And so you have this reinforcing and unwarranted effect of the single market that the most vulnerable regions, for a number of reasons, historic, geography, and you haven't even thought of enlargement of 2004 to the Central and Eastern European countries at the moment. But within the older Europe, you already saw that if you want to deepen Europe, if you want to deepen the internal market, not only it's fair, we have to support the most vulnerable regions, but more importantly, we need to tap on their potential. You know, the projects I saw yesterday, for example, um, such as the Bismarck or the Green, green Industrial Symbiosis in Ogne, it's not about the European cohesion policy and the European Union are there to give you and help you with the support tools and the financing is obviously very important. But it's to tap on the potential that you have, on all the ideas that you have in the region, on all the capacities that you have in these regions. And without this potential and without these ideas and without the efforts, the tools would be of no avail. So it was also to tap on the potential of these regions that cohesion policy was created. But nowadays, we have even a, another reason why we should and need to continue having an efficient cohesion policy that delivers to all the citizens, because we need to look at the global picture. Jacques Delors could not think of, or maybe he could still think of, that we were going to have a war at the door of the European Union in during its times. You know, we celebrated the 70 years of peace in Europe very recently. It has been a period where we had uh, an inimaginable period where we had peace and prosperity in Europe, but things are changing very quickly, and we know that very well. Um, and in this context of increasing uncertainty and conflict in the world, cohesion policy promotes regional growth, yes. It fights against 
brain drain, and you know that very well. You know about people drain in your regions very well. You know about desertification of, the, of these remote regions, but it also addresses what we call the geography of discontent. Because the way the internal market and our economies are um, set up, it always promotes, as I said, convergence to the, to, to, the, to the urban poles, to the more developed poles in the European Union. And the truth is, we left a lot of people behind. And we left a lot of regions behind, despite cohesion policy. Because there are a number of, success, a number of successive crises. I mean, cohesion policy is important. You will have uh, um, you know, presentation about the budget and how, much, how important it is for the European budget. But it's peanuts compared to the, basically the, the, the finance and the economics available in the European Union. And then you have global world, the global trade and global tendencies that you need to cater also for. You need to, be, to have a new European Union open to the world. But all this brings tension and concentrates the challenges in a few, and unfortunately they're not such a few, more uh, poorest regions in the EU. And especially, it brings a lot of challenges to our citizens who live in these regions. And so if you want to tackle this geography of discontent, if we want to continue supporting the European democracy, the European values, the European Union for what it stands in the world, we need to continue to having a very strong and robust cohesion policy. So it's not only about giving the tools and the means for the regions that are less developed or that are uh, more vulnerable. It's only about tapping the potential of these regions for the benefit of the whole European Union. It's about defending the European way of life and our democracy. And we've seen that European cohesion has brought a lot of achievements throughout the years. I can give you a number of, lots of numbers about, you know, 40. 0.4 million businesses that has supported. It created almost 400,000 new jobs. It allowed for more than 10 million people to gain a qualification to be better in the labor market. It built childcare and education infrastructure for the benefit of more than 24 million children and young people around Europe. But we also know that the regional disparities, because of the successive crisis and other tensions, have Decreased, yes, thanks to cohesion policy, but there's still a lot of challenges in many member states and the European Union about regional disparities, and you know them well. Because capital regions concentrate the investments, the human capital, the research and innovation, and other regions, the remote and rural areas, they face they, need, they face a lot of struggles to boost their economic activity and they face huge demographic challenges. And Sweden is, of course, no exception to this trend. So cohesion policy needs to continue bridging this gap in the future. But cohesion policy also does other things. You know, it bridges the gaps between the regions, but it also keeps an eye in the future. And we kept an eye, so we support those policies and those investments that will help Europe move in the right direction in the future. And I'm talking obviously about the green transition and the digital. And so cohesion policy has been also a key instrument to achieve a greener Europe on the ground and to attain the target of being climate neutral continent by 2050 and a target that Sweden aims at reaching already in 2045. So, in this period, 21-27, cohesion policy is delivering about 118 billion euros in investments in climate action, energy efficiency, circular economy, risk management, just to mention a few areas. And this represents a significant contribution to the EU climate goals in line with the European Green Deal. And the transition to climate neutrality will also have an unequal impact on the different territories, as you know impacts that have not been overlooked by our cohesion policy. Even Sweden, in Sweden, the climate change will affect differently the different parts of the country. 
Think about forest fires or floods becoming more frequent, or how the rise of temperatures is affecting the northern regions, and the rise of the oceans is affecting the coastal regions. So these regions and their communities will also have specific needs that should be answered to with a specific mix of investments. And for example, in 21-27, the national Swedish ERDF program includes possibilities for the municipalities to invest in climate change adaptation, prevention and management of climate-related risks like floods and storms. And in, nor in the northernmost ERDF program of Upper Norland, attention is given to the effects of climate change on forestry, for example. But cohesion policy has another feature that is very important to keep. It's the partnership principle. It's the way it is delivered. Uh, cohesion policy supports the process by working in close cooperation with all the stakeholders on the ground to make our policies and investments acceptable and efficient. It's not only about identifying the needs and the strategies to tackle those needs with the stakeholders on the ground, so the delivery mode, the partnership principle, is embedded. It's the, in the DNA of cohesion policy and should remain. Because it is the most efficient way, let alone for this reason, it is the most efficient way of delivering regional development. And look at the newly created the Just Transition Fund, which is a new fund created in this period to support those that are going to be most affected by the green transition, and in particular by the coal transition. And as you know, in North Sweden, the JTF is supporting the greening of the metal, the steel industries, and in the regions of Westerbotten and Norrbotten. And we should not forget to mention the cooperation with partners across the border, because this is another feature of cohesion policy, partnership and cooperation among not only the EU regions, but also the, the wider world around us. And look, for example, at the Interreg projects, Sweden-Norway, Aurora, and the Northern Periphery programs, and the added value that they bring to the green transition, because we have similar challenges, we have similar potentials, and we need to access resources for the sustainable development of the regions, and we can't do it alone. We should do it with our partners who face the same challenges and have the same opportunities. So, as you see, cohesion policy also stands out for its great contribution to the green transition in Europe. And we are focusing on achieving the climate and environmental goals, but addressing its social and economic challenges arising from these efforts. So, how does this leave us for the future? Cohesion policy is more needed than ever for the reasons I just mentioned. The future of cohesion policy should be able to take up these new challenges, but embrace also the change and address what we know as the current shortcomings. It will be for the next European Commission to decide how, and the European Parliament, and of course the new Council, um, to decide how, what it's going to look like, the proposal and the new cohesion policy uh, programming period. But there are certain things we already know. We need to work on, uh, we need to modernize it. And how do we need to modernize it? We need to work on governance. Cohesion policy is delivered through the member states and with the member states. It's not the European Commission in Brussels and DG Regio who delivers cohesion policy. We're there to facilitate the process. We're there to support you with tools and initiatives. But it's you, Sweden, the regional, the, the national level, the regional level and the local level that deliver cohesion policy, because cohesion policy is for you. So governance and initiative capacity at national and regional administrations are critical for the effective implementation of the policy. So we need to continue enhancing the quality of governance and of the institutions. This is fundamental. We need it to build in more flexibility to enable more reactive to many things, because the world is becoming more and more challenging and more and more quick in the challenges and the crises we need to tackle. And cohesion policy has been there to, uh, and has delivered and gave a response to the number of crises we've had since the financial crisis in 2008, if you think of 
COVID, if you think of Ukraine, if you think of the energy crisis, uh, if you think of now the needs to step up uh, the investment in key and innovative and green technologies, cohesion policies has always been called, because it's a third of the budget, of the EU budget. It has always been called, and because it has the network, it has the structures in place to deliver and to respond to this crisis. So while embarking on this modernization, cohesion policy should also continue to build in the main fo principles, focusing on the regional conversions, but continuing to deliver always high levels of support to the less developed regions. We cannot have a regional policy that will not deliver to the regions and to the locals and to the citizens. We will probably have an enhanced link to reforms. You know, you all know the Recover and Resilience Facility and the Recover and Resilience Plan. This was a model where the European Union has linked reforms to investments. And this has been proved to be a successful, um, a successful model. And if you think about the investments very often, and you know that, they meet a number of bottlenecks and difficulties on the ground, and we need a number of policy reforms at member state level to make those investments more quick, more efficient, and more impactful. So link between reforms and investments will definitely probably be uh, an important feature of the, of the future. And of course, simplification of the programming framework, of the delivery mechanisms to ensure that implementation can be accelerated, but also easier. You know, I was speaking to a number of you yesterday and you were telling me how difficult it is to convince SMEs to be part of your projects, uh, to convince a number of other smaller institutions to be part of the projects because it is a cumbersome policy. So we need to continue simplifying it and making it more flexible so to ensure that you know, all the good projects are supported. And of course, we need to improve our audit procedures. Um, it is important to protect the, the taxpayer money and the EU taxpayer money and, uh, and budget, but it's also important to continue uh, simplifying the audit procedures so that uh, they don't become a bottleneck to the development. Um, and then at the same time, you know, we have enlargement, future enlargement. And Ukraine is not a small country. So we need to, there will be a number of challenges with this new enlargement and future enlargement to the European Union. But the European Union and cohesion policy have also proved successful in dealing with the huge enlargement of 2004 to the Central and Eastern European countries. So we are positive in the European Commission. We can tackle, there's no question that we need to embrace Ukraine in our bigger European project. But we also need to continue taking care of the existing member states and their populations and of their more remote and more vulnerable regions. So cohesion policy needs to be more simple, more impactful, more um, efficient in, the, in its delivering mode because we need to cater for new, but we also need to continue catering for our existing member states and the regions. And in that respect, if you want to know more, I invite you to read the ninth cohesion report that was recently published. And we have all the data and more information about what cohesion has done for the European Union, but also how it could look like in the future. So I outlined here some of the thoughts of how the future of cohesion policy could look like. And although the European Commission is responsible for drafting the proposal, it will be up to you the Member States and the European Parliament to decide on it. In other words, it is up to you to influence those discussions and to also to tailor those decisions. So I would like to leave you with one request. Use your influence. Thank you very much.